Um, and it's great to be back in my home state. As I was telling the group at lunch, I'm from Southern California, so don't hold that against me. Um, but the Bay Area is still has a special place in my heart um, and I think is maybe a little bit better than LA, but don't tell anyone I told you that. Um, but um, as um, uh, was mentioned in the introduction, I will be talking about um, telehealth and kind of coming from a perspective of someone that studies organizations. And particularly, I've been increasingly interested in the intersection between technology and policy. So my talk today um, overlaps in that regard um, with the talk on Monday about looking at policies and organizations. Um, but specifically, I'm looking at the, um, the um, example of telehealth. So my talk today, Healthcare Beyond the Doctor's Office, examining misalignments between telehealth, smartphone apps, and US healthcare policies. So again, to give a little bit of um, background to my research program um, that I broadly um, look at how technology and communication co-evolve in ways that help people create and share knowledge. Um, so as I will talk about today in the healthcare context, um, but I've also looked at this with the change of a policy and technology implementation at a healthcare manufacturer. I um, have also looked at this, um, the role of enterprise social media and the global offshoring of digital tasks. Um, but to frame my talk today, um, when we're looking at the healthcare um, industry, that it's no surprise that right now that we're in a bit of a healthcare crisis. That we know that there's high healthcare costs, there's increase in chronic illnesses, and we have an increasing aging population. And couple that with a projected physician shortage that we realize that we really are at the crux of a crisis. One of the ways, um, many of the ways that have been um, um, to address this healthcare crisis is using telehealth, telemedicine, and virtual health all under um, the same umbrella, and being able to address some of these issues with the healthcare crisis, particularly with as we deal with the projected physician shortage as well. So when I talk about telehealth, I want to back up a little bit and giving a little bit of history of telehealth. Um, that at lunch we were talking about some of our favorite papers or um, maybe books that we read this year. Um, and one of the interesting books that I read was looking at the history of telehealth. That it's been around and the notions of it have been around longer than what we may have thought about just with the introduction of smartphones. Um, so here there's a picture of um, this machine called the teledactyl machine that um, was supposedly a way for the clinician to feel the patient at a distance. So not necessarily just changing the site of care from the clinician's office um, to the patient's home, but being able to also feel at a distance as well. And we see in the second picture, picture the radio doctor, maybe, um, of the patient in bed, um, connecting, communicating um, with their physician remotely and having this device that is giving the output of what the physician is seeing, how the patient should be interacting. Um, so these um, large scale visions of what we thought telemedicine or telehealth um, could be um, were even even pre, um, predated for before our use of smartphones and, and um, screen technologies. Um, but we kind of see a different notion of these today where they're mostly um, through connecting with a clinician through a screen, whether on an iPad or a smartphone, um, but being able to get that care at a distance, maybe not being able to feel at a distance, um, but still being able to communicate across geographic boundaries. Now, telehealth um, has been, there's different modalities of telehealth, and um, mostly for my talk today, I'm going to focus on mobile health or in-health, um, but I want to give a little bit of a lay of the land before I dig into the details. Um, so for one, there's live video, which allows for synchronous communication. Um, this can be clinician to clinician, as we see in the, the upper picture, where a specialist might be um, consulted in um, through video conferencing. Um, we see this a lot with um, telestroke um, um, services, where at the point of um, a patient um, experiencing a stroke, if a specialist is not immediately available at, say, a smaller community hospital, they can try to um, connect with that specialist um, remotely. Um, and there's also um, instances of having live video and synchronous through these telehealth kiosks um, that might be at airports or even at um, your local drugstore where you enter a kiosk and you can interact with that physician face-to-face -face, um, synchronously. And the advantage of some of these kiosks that they will have different devices and peripherals that you could use such as a um, 
something to measure your heart rates or your um, having to take your temperature or taking your weight, um, but having the um, access to all of those tools within the kiosk there. Um, there's also um, store and forward um, modalities, which allows for asynchronous um, communication. Um, and this has been um, an increase of this has been seen in dermatology um, that's very much visually based and being able to take a picture of um, something going on with the skin or another ailment and then forwarding that information um, to that specialist. Also with remote patient monitoring, um, such as in this case, if a patient is discharged um, from the hospital, um, giving them the tools um, that they would need to be able to monitor their health to try to avoid um, a readmission um, back into the hospital um, for more acute um, issues. And then lastly, as I mentioned, that I'll be focusing on mobile health, mHealth, specifically where um, communication with a clinician is involved and also including both synchronous um, when you can also have live video, um, as in with the top picture that you can actually c communicate with the physician in real time or asynchronous such as we've seen with the introduction of apps such as Talkspace or Alternative, um, which allows for vision testing. Warby Parker has a similar one where you might not be communicating um, in real time um, with that therapist or with that um, ophthalmologist, but sending your information and waiting for a response or a prescription. So even though that we've seen the increase in all of these different telehealth technologies um, that we're, I will talk about today, there have been these policy concerns um, with telehealth use. Um, for one, uh, one of the major barriers has been um, creating the appropriate reimbursement models um, that on one side that there's interest from healthcare consumers, but making sure that clinicians who participate are getting paid for that interaction. Um, so reimbursement uh, models have been one of the biggest barriers with telehealth adoption, but with recent policy changes have allowed for more flexibility with that. Um, secondly, with providing quality of care, um, that there's concerns that is the interaction that someone has um, on um, using telehealth, is that going to be the same as the interaction that they would have had face-to-face -face with their physician? Um, and with issues of quality of care, um, there have been growing concerns with malpractice liability. Um, someone as this comic kind of alludes to either you have a virus or my computer does, is that then when the technology goes wrong, then who is to blame? Is it the clinician, is it the patient, or is it looking at um, the technology? But there's been very few policies on um, malpractice liability because there hasn't really been um, much of a precedent set for this quite yet. And then also that largely that the policies really focus on defining clinical interactions. So what actually constitutes as a visit? Is it one message exchange um, with your physician or is it actually having this live interaction? Um, online prescribing also has been a very big issue in terms of what constitutes a clinical reaction to get a prescription. Um, credentialing and licensing, as well as how clinicians can practice over state lines. So even though we see how telehealth can erase some of our geographic um, constraints with technology that allows us to talk and to connect over distance, um, that these boundaries in terms of how clinicians can practice within their own state lines still remains. And so there's been tensions with policies and telehealth use um, with that as well. So. Um, as uh, was mentioned, that I come from a perspective of understanding and studying organizations. And so I want to take a little bit of a step back to kind of um, frame how I think about policy. Um, so I think about policy as being constituted by both the text artifacts, so the policy texts that say what we can and cannot do, and also technology that is the means by which we enact that policy. Um, so when we're thinking about policies that in the US, healthcare is very highly regulated, but policies are also highly variable as well. And in part, that's because people can have different interpretations of the very same policy, even if that policy is very well articulated. And we see this in healthcare today, and also as I will talk later about how we see this um, uh, taking place in telehealth, um, that telehealth um, texts are very, um, variable even across um, different states. And then as we think about the mode through which those policies are enacted, that technology is a means to implement policy, but technologies are also flexible as well. 
and that how we think about how, how technology is designed does not always equate with actual use. Um, technologies are interpretively flexible in that the meanings that a designer has for creating that technology are not necessarily the same meanings that the user will take from those technologies as well. And so we have this interesting tension and trade-off between how we think about policy text, so policy with a lowercase p, and technology. And I draw from uh, Martha Feldman and Brian Pentland in their discussion on organizational routines, where they talk about organizational routine have two aspects, that there is an ostensive aspect and what that routine means in principle, and then there's a performative aspect and what that routine means in practice. So I draw from that in how I think about policy with a capital P, and that policy is con um, constituted by policy texts that tell us what that policy means in the ostensive aspect, and then the performative aspect, meaning the technology that allows us to enact that policy. So we have these two sides of policy, uppercase P, uh, with both text and technology that should coincide and should have this symbiotic relationship with one another. But oftentimes, there's different stakeholders designing them and how they are implemented um, sometimes do not always um, lead to a symbiotic relationship between the text and the technology. So the three research questions um, that I will um, present today um, with thinking about this in the case of telehealth is one, how are telehealth policies articulated? Two, how are telehealth app apps communicated to healthcare consumers? And three, getting at this tension and this relationship between text and technology, how are telehealth policies and apps aligned with one another, if at all? So in the, the study um, that I'll be talking about, um, with collecting the policy texts, um, we utilize the Center for Connected Health Policy that allows um, for public information about all of telehealth policies across the US. Um, and as you can imagine, that there are highly, high variability in how each state defines telehealth on every different level. So in how they define telehealth, what technologies constitute as telehealth, how people are, how clinicians are reimbursed um, for services. Um, so we pulled every single policy text document um, from each of the states. And they include current and pending policies, but we only drew from the current policies for each state. Um, that was for the year of 2017. And for collecting the, the apps, um, so we wanted to see in terms of how these apps were communicated and how they aligned with how the policies um, frame telehealth, um, we collected the descriptions of all telehealth telemedicine apps from Apple's App Store. Um, there was quite a bit of overlap between the apps that were um, in Apple Store as well as um, Android apps. Uh, did I see a hand? Sorry, just one clarification. Mm -hmm. The policies you're grabbing, were they specifically about telehealth or just health more broadly? Specifically about telehealth. Yes. Um, and with um, pulling the, all of the apps, um, there's no specific category for telehealth or telemedicine on the App Store. Um, so we use search terms such as e-health, telemedicine, telehealth, e-visit, doctor on demand um, to pull the apps and then also use a snowballing technique to see which apps were recommended. Um, we had um, got a total of 81 apps. Um, we had to make sure that we cleaned up um, from apps that were copycat apps um, that we found that was a little bit of a trend um, with collecting um, all of the apps and specifically apps that involved an interaction with a clinician. Um, so we did not include apps such as a Fitbit tracker app or calorie counting apps or um, menu um, apps where you log your, have a food diary, um, since that is only on the end of the um, consumer to implement that information, but it's not sent to a clinician. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we were capturing apps that involve some type of interaction um, between both the healthcare consumer and the um, clinician as well. Um, so, yes. Did they include mental health apps too? Or? Yes, okay. we did. Yeah, and mental health, um, specifically apps that involved with um, talking to a therapist, um, since there were some apps that um, allowed you to track your mood but didn't have a connection to a therapist. And yes. are copycat apps apps that just share the same name but don't do anything, or they're 
copying the functionality and pretending to be that brand? Or what, what does that mean? Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, because the the latter that were not necessarily copycat apps were apps that were white labeled. Um, that maybe a specific health system was using that app as the platform. So we did include those, since the descriptions also would vary. Um, but the copycat apps, um, what we noticed, they would tend to be apps that didn't have any reviews that, um, I mean, many of them were not ranked, but didn't have any ranking, but would use the same um, screenshots when you were looking at descriptions, um, but may not have any um, text in the description. Um, so we made sure that um, within the, the three people that were looking at the apps and looking at the final list that we were having similarity in coding um, those as well. Um, but it was we were really surprised to find how many copy, I don't have the exact number of how many copycat apps there were, but it kind of raises this um, question in terms of people that are downloading these copycat apps and thinking that they're going to connect um, with a clinician might also be problematic for this ecosystem. So with um, analyzing um, the data um, that we used a grounded theory approach um, where we had four, three different stages um, of looking at the data from the policies as well as the um, descriptions of the applications that we gathered. Um, and using the grounded theory approach that we didn't necessarily begin with hypotheses, but we let the themes emerge um, through the data. So in the first stage of coding, um, where we looked at the policy text documents, um, so again, that there's quite a variability across each of the states of the policy documents. So we were looking for not necessarily seeing which state agreed with another state, um, which states were more restrictive than others, um, but wanted to look for the broad themes on how that they were defining telehealth and the interactions of using telehealth. So the three themes that we um, found across all of the policies um, were how, um, tele how telehealth was defined in terms of people, place, and technology. And I'll get a little bit more into that um, in the findings as well. Um, and secondly, um, when looking at the telehealth apps, that we were looking for what expectations do telehealth apps communicate to users. Um, and the three themes that emerged from that was how they communicate about speed in terms of convenience, low cost, and a high quality of care. And then lastly, um, that focusing on how telehealth apps' expectations aligned with telehealth themes in terms of people, place, and technology, those earlier themes that I presented, um, we looked for instances on how this policy and tech um, aligned or misaligned um, with looking between both the telehealth apps and the policy text documents. So in um, going over the findings that I'll go over, three main um, findings. Um, but as a quick overview, um, the three sections that I'll um, discuss for the latter half of the talk is one, um, the theme that emerged from how policy texts overwhelmingly focus on technology um, compared to how they focus on interactions with people and in terms of how they um, discuss place. Um, and we'll kind of unpack a little bit how this might be problematic knowing that how technology um, and the development of these new telehealth apps will outpace how policy is revised and defined um, might be problematic and how these policies cannot keep up with the pace of these new, um, how telehealth technologies change. Um, and secondly, um, that I will discuss how, which might not be surprising at all, but how telehealth apps set very high expectations for what healthcare consumers can expect um, from using these telehealth apps. Um, of course, we would expect that in the app description to try to get people to download and use the app that they want to try to be persuasive and trying to set a high bar of expectations. Um, but this leads me to um, discussing the third part of the findings and how we see these misalignments and these tensions between how policy texts are framed and how telehealth apps are communicated. So first, um, as I mentioned in talking about how policy texts were skewed in terms of how they fo overly focus on technology itself. Um, and those three themes that um, I mentioned earlier in terms of people, place, and technology, that across all of the policy text um, documents, the overwhelmingly that they talk about specific instances of technology and how that technology should be used. Um, so in 316 instances across all of the policy text um, documents, that in terms of um, live um, video reimbursement, um, that there was um, a lot of heavy weight on talking about how 
Um, live video is often the preferred mode of communication, and those are often the moments of that will actually be reimbursed. Um, there was also a focus on email, phone, and fax. Why fax? I'm not quite sure, <laughs> but this also kind of alludes to the point of um, trying to keep up with technologies that quickly might become outdated in terms of how people um, communicate and interact. Um, also in terms of store and forward um, reimbursements, in terms of what constitutes as store and forward and what type of information can be um, collected and sent and to whom and then also um, site transmission fees. So these also focus on in terms of reimbursements and, and fees and the site transmission fee um, would focus on um, what fees a, a particular site might have to charge if they were sending out um, particular information. And in terms of people in place um, where people kind of um, was on 149 instances and in how people were described across um, policy texts and, and I think I had the expectation that people might be um, given more weight in how these policies are being framed um, in terms of how they talk about online prescribing, in terms of who is able to actually um, write that prescription in an online context, um, in terms of consent, um, and also a discussion in um, private payers. Um, and with private payers refer to insurance companies, whereas public payers um, refer to federal or state governments. And in terms of place, in terms of geography, um, there was um, instances of talking about cross-state licensing, um, location in terms of what constitutes um, the, the site of care, um, whether that is um, a, a patient's home or um, another clinical um, setting where they're receiving care, and also remote patient monitoring in terms of what constitutes as being remote patient monitoring and um, what um, and how clinicians will oversee that as well. Um, so, so as I mentioned, so with technology, kind of this instance in being specific in the types of technology as well and how they expect those technologies to operate and how those technology interactions will then be reimbursed and paid for um, was overwhelmingly the focus um, for the policy texts. Um, and I will get into a little bit later in terms of why this is interesting in terms of seeing the policies framed in this way. So to give a little bit of context, um, drawing from an example of my, my own, my current um, state of residence, um, Michigan, um, and how they define um, telehealth policy from their live video reimbursement um, that they state that to can be considered telemedicine, and they use the term telemedicine, um, that the healthcare professional must be able to examine the patient in real time, interactive audio or video, or both tele communication system, and the patient must be able to interact with the off-site healthcare professional at the time the services are provided. So even though some states had similar definitions of telemedicine or telehealth, um, but it's interesting to, to note how specific they were. So in this example that we see that there's like the focus on the technology itself to provide, um, being able to provide this um, synchronous um, interaction specifically through audio or video, um, and that the patient must be able to interact with the offsite healthcare professional um, at a specific time. And Michigan is one of the examples where asynchronous telehealth apps, um, such as vision apps, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, store that have the store and forward um, model, are not, um, healthcare consumers are not allowed to use those types of apps and being able to uh, receive a prescription um, or even being able to interact on these apps at all. Um, so in another project um, that I'm looking at with the use of vision care apps, um, just to mention that briefly, um, it creates some of these, um, these barriers in being able to actually um, do that study because um, vision care apps um, that track where your location is, um, it's difficult to even be able to even use the app. So some apps might allow you to choose your location, but that brings up this question in terms of the ethics and being able to do that. So why make such a distinction between synchronous and asynchronous support? That's a good question. So. My thoughts with that is that I think with, there's a concern that asynchronous or synchronous mimics more of our, uh, how a patient provider interaction would already be face to face. In asynchronous that it becomes this um, lesser valued interaction. 
Um, so with the vision test um, apps that I mentioned, um, so Michigan being one of the states that doesn't allow these tests, um, so optometrists have lobbied very hard in saying that this does not equate to the interaction that I would have with my patient when they're sitting in the chair and I'm asking them, do you see better with one or two? That you know, I have the expertise in being able to do that as opposed to them doing that through, through an app. Um, and I think that there's also concerns in, in terms of what can happen in between that gap um, when you're waiting for the message from your provider or um, is there um, opportunities for um, things to go wrong? So it's seen as that asynchronous is, or synchronous, sorry, is the gold standard by some telehealth policies um, framing. Um, and secondly, to kind of go over how these apps are communicated, as I mentioned that you know, this kind of sounds a little bit like a no-brainer, that of course they want to propose speed and convenience, um, also mentioning about low cost and high quality of care. Um, but even with low cost, um, across most of the apps, there was a, an example of, of just one um, example of an app does not um, give an exact cost on how much it would um, be to actually use the app. Um, so reading the descriptions that people see that it's low cost and thinking that it's going to be less than what they normally would use in the traditional sense. Um, and a high quality of care that is communicated, that assurance that the doctors are board certified, um, and including very friendly pictures of physicians in their white coats, um, assuring that you, know, you will be able to get the best of the best, but there's no assurance that you would necessarily be able to receive your own doc, uh, being able to connect with your own doctor if your health system is not participating with some of these apps. So to kind of show you some examples on um, how some of these apps are described, Amwell being one of the leaders um, in this category, um, that if you're feeling sick, you can have a high quality, affordable medical care right in the palm of your hands and on demand, um, that it's the best way to see someone, a uh, doctor in minutes, board certified, experienced medical providers, and that you have access to someone 24 seven, even next day availability, um, and that you can bring healthcare home, feel better, faster. Um, who would not want to do this rather than waiting four weeks out to see your doctor, or if you're in Michigan like me on those wonderful snowy days where you don't feel like shoveling your car out, um, that you can have this immediate access to someone that would be just as good to someone that I might see at Michigan Medicine. Another example of doctor on demand, um, another leader in this category, um, that they reiterate some of these same things that you can, you don't have to deal with the hassle of the waiting room, that you can um, see a doctor within minutes, it's going to be just like an in-person visit. So again, um, emphasizing that it's going to be the same as if you're going to see someone in person. Um, and that they give examples of the different types of um, things that they would treat, being able to see um, a doctor on demand um, with their app, mental health being one of them, um, and that the services are available with and without insurance. So this mention in terms of cost, um, but don't specifically mention what that cost is. Um, and that they try to present it as being equitable and open um, for everyone, and that you can see exactly what your visit will cost, but we're not gonna tell you exactly what it is now, um, and that there are no monthly fees. So the reason that I wanted to um, you know, present you know, how these apps are being communicated, um, and then um, earlier presenting and how we think about these policies being framed in terms of people, technology, and, and place, that if we kind of go back to kind of my earlier framing and how I think about policy as being constituted by text and um, technology and taking this socio-material approach to how we would define um, policy, that we have this social component of people and their interactions, and this material component here focusing mostly on digital technology, but that can also refer to non-digital technology tools as well. And then also thinking about place as this material element that can change and, and can influence how our interactions are. And when we think about defining telehealth policy that is con constituted by all of these different aspects. So with looking at the misalignments that we looked across all of these three categories in terms of people, that we see that what was missing from 
um, also the apps, and um, that was not necessarily aligned with the policies, is talking about what is the role of the patient and the healthcare consumer that's not really clearly defined. That it's putting all of the onus on the clinician, that the clinician is going to be the one to see you, the clinician is going to be the one to go through all the protocols, but in this instance that if someone is accessing care from their home, that there is an activity that then the patient has to do. Um, is do you have appropriate, um, uh, the, your, is your device up to speed? Um, do you have Wi-Fi access? What should you do in terms of if you are to lose um, connectivity? Um, how should you think about communicating what, how you are feeling when the doctor does not, is not able to feel at a distance? Um, so when they're not able to actually see you face to face, that you are losing some of those moments in that interaction that we would expect in a traditional healthcare setting. Um, but moving this now to being in technology media that there's a shift in what that consumer is going to have to do. Um, and that that expectation is not really clearly aligned um, from what the tele tele telehealth apps present. And it's also unclear how to manage the burden on caregivers and clinicians. Um, so the policies that focus mostly on how um, clinicians are reimbursed, how they should um, perform those interactions, um, but from telehealth apps that it may be a way in being able to broaden access and people being able to access physicians, um, but there's no clear articulation in um, both the policies and telehealth apps and how it is going to maybe increase the burden on clinicians. That if you're having to see multiple people back to back with using these telehealth apps, is that giving you less time that you might be able to interact um, with your patient? I mean, also with caregivers as well, that if you're helping someone to actually use the app um, to access care, what does that mean in terms of what the caregiver should be responsible for doing? So in the framing of some of the descriptions that they will talk about how um, you can use it for your family, but not really being clear in terms of what your role as a caregiver should be. Um, in terms of place, that how the descriptions in the apps um, note what constitutes as home, um, it's still very ambiguous. And as I mentioned again with the vision care apps, that if your home might be somewhere, um, aside from where you're visiting, that my home right now is in Michigan, but if I were to use one of the vision care apps here in California, that I technically would be able to get through and use that Warby Parker prescription check app um, if I were to pay out of pocket. Um, so there's ways in trying to think about how people might be able to work around the system because again, if we think about how technologies are also flexible, they might be encouraging, might be offering ways of having to have these workarounds, um, working around the policies that might prevent them to using them in other contexts. And what's also unclear is how the apps define the place for clinicians. So in terms of policies that they make it clear in terms of where the originating site of where the clinician might have to deliver care may be, but from the app, there's no clear um, description in terms of where your doctor is. Is your doctor um, going to be at their office when they have access to their other colleagues to ask questions if needed, or are they at home too being able to connect with you um, remotely? Um, for um, some of the policies are also unclear about this um, with um, in terms of um, some of the mental health um, apps, um, but for some of the um, non-mental health apps, they're more clear in terms of where the clinician um, needs to be. Um, in terms of technology, um, where I, I would argue that we see some of the, the biggest misalignment is as with the focus on how policies are framing them being very technology centric in terms of the technology should um, have this aspect allowing this type of communication that if we're specifically talking about email, phone, and fax, um, which are in some ways outdated uh, modalities of telehealth right now, that we understand that technology changes very frequently and current apps um, on the App Store are being introduced and they're also changing very frequently as well. And that if policies are going to be very technology centric in terms of how they're defining telehealth, that it's difficult to think about how those policies um, might not be able to actually capture um, technology mediated interactions in a clinical setting if those technologies are constantly changing. Um, and there's also the assumption that 
technology-mediated clinical interactions require no change in behaviors. Um, so I mentioned this earlier before in the, the people, the social aspect, um, but as um, a healthcare consumer or a patient, what should I then be responsible for for managing this interaction? And that's not clearly um, articulated um, in, the, in how these apps are described and also in how these policies define what the, the patient should be responsible for beyond um, payment. And the focus um, in the policies in talking about uh, quality of care as being very important and how these descriptions of the apps also have a high bar and how we will promise you low cost and speed and convenience and so on. Um, but there's no discussion in what should the quality of the technology, what should the quality of that technology be? Um, that if we're thinking about using this as the means through which to deliver care, should we think about actually think on how we define what um, is a high bar for the quality um, of these apps? So the question again about these copycat apps, that if these are in the market kind of diluting in terms of what telehealth can actually do, um, do these copycat apps and apps that maybe don't have the best functionalities lower the quality of um, telehealth delivery? And one of the concerns of um, why I'm interested in looking at this relationship between policy and technology um, in telehealth is that I think that this has a lot of implications for the future of telehealth and how we think about how telehealth can or maybe hinder um, the, the, the delivery of care. So as we think about how telehealth is changing the notion of the site of care, um, that we have to think beyond just the technology itself, but giving more focus to what constitutes as place, um, that if we're thinking about implementing um, telehealth in homes, schools, and also community centers, um, how do we think about how technology can support um, other non-clinical settings for supporting um, people's health and well-being? And also um, how patient-clinician interactions are fundamentally changed um, as we're thinking about changing the site of care and as we're thinking about delivering care through a technology-mediated interaction. That there's a shift, as I mentioned earlier, in what patients should be expected to be able to do and manage the interactions where the burden is not necessarily only on the clinician in this interaction. And this also brings up questions in what constitutes care that is good enough that um, some of the proponents of that are creating telehealth apps would argue that there's no difference between in-person interaction um, for receiving care versus um, technology-mediated interaction. Um, but others, on the other hand, as I mentioned with the example of the vision apps and optometrists, would argue, yes, there is quite a difference, that I'm able to pick up things that the patient is not going to detect, um, that doing a vision test for just renewing your contacts or your eyeglass prescription is one thing, but someone that has maybe never seen an optometrist, um, that that optometrist has the expertise in being able to see what that patient, see pun intended, um, seeing what that patient um, might not be able to catch on their own through using these applications. But some would argue that if this is the instance where someone that would not have received care otherwise, is this maybe good enough? And should we think about leaving some flexibility with some of these policies to allow some of these telehealth apps that might not necessarily meet the gold standard of face-to-face -face care, but it's a way by which someone might be introduced in having an open opportunity to get into the healthcare setting that normally would may have not otherwise. And, and coupled with that too, I think that it also brings questions into who benefits from using these telehealth apps. Um, the parallel with this um, that I would see with a lot of online education uh, with Coursera and similar platforms such as that, there have been findings that have shown that those who benefit the most from taking these online courses are those who already have degrees and that are looking to gain new skills or to further their, their education. Um, so it, it's kind of helping those who are already at the top end being able to be able to access more and being able to benefit the most. Whereas earlier conceptualizations and are we going to be able to have those benefit who may not have had access 
um, otherwise or cannot pay for um, higher education, um, would they be the ones to benefit? But we see um, research that's suggesting that might not be the case. So I wonder in terms of how some of these policies are framed and also in terms of how these telehealth apps are described, if they're catering to those that already have the technology skills and also the understanding on how to manage their own health, that it's just an added bonus and that they're able to get that additional doctor's appointment or being able to get a second opinion. Um, but we might not necessarily see those who could benefit the most, such as older adults um, who might have um, difficulty and getting um, access to care through transportation or relying on caregivers to transport them might not be the ones to benefit due to low tech literacy or low tech skills. And also those that live in remote areas that might not necessarily have um, the uh, adequate internet access to be able to access um, these telehealth apps. And then lastly, um, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, that the concern with physician burnout, um, that even though that there's been um, a crisis in terms of um, not having enough physicians and also nurse practitioners being able to meet the demand of healthcare needs. But are we introducing a technology that is going to further um, um, strain the burnout that physicians might be um, experiencing already, but just through another medium of interaction? Um, so on that note, I will wrap up. And I also want to um, thank my um, collaborator um, for this and also some of the students that were helpful in collecting the policy data as well. So thank you. And I look forward to your feedback and questions. Yeah. Time for discussion. Yeah, so I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about the policy process, because um, a lot of times my uh, intuition is that policy in terms of technology is very reactive. So like technology like advances and then there's this very um, vertical process that, that shapes. And you kind of mentioned that with the optometrists, like they're lobbying to influence the policy. So I, I don't know if you have any um, research that I was looking at kind of the, the relationship between the policy and the technology and how it's sometimes going to be reactive. Yeah, so great question. So my collaborator and I are, are looking at now what are the specific differences across the states. And from early findings, what I could suggest from that, it definitely seems that there are some states that might be more, I won't say reactive, but maybe more progressive. Um, California being one of them that has one of the most um, progressive telehealth policies. Um, and other states where it looks very slow to adopt that are still making references to facts, you know, as I mentioned. Um, and other policies that might be specific towards uh, mentioning that there are these applications and being a little bit more mindful in how these applications might look across different clinical areas. Um, so I, I would say that it still seems as though these telehealth policies are still somewhat slow to evolve, that the technologies uh, really do um, outpace how these um, policies are um, developed and when they're actually um, enacted. So we, um, in that next um, iteration that I mentioned, we'll start looking at the pending policies where we can kind of see some of that um, in terms of like what is the degree and how much of a leap from uh, what is currently on the books versus the pending policies that um, might be actually um, put into law um, later on. But overall, I would say it's a longer, slower process, and the policies are trying to keep up. Yes. So you mentioned early on, and I agree, that uh, designer intention does not equal user practice. And I wonder if by focusing on what the apps were advertising as their functionality, we might be missing out on what people are actually using them for. Um, so, you know, as an example, maybe yes, this you know this app can do lots of things, but ultimately, what people really end up using it for is just like messaging, saying like, "Hey, I need a refill for this thing." Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, do you, do you have any of that qualitative evidence in any direction? How would you anticipate usage? is actually comparing to what the apps are trying to advertise as their, as their, as their wins. Yes, and um, a great, nice segue to the, the vision app study that I, that I mentioned I didn't present today um, to try to look at that exact question as well. Um, that are people looking at using this for, I'm not comfortable going to an optometrist or I've never been. 
um, or that I'm just looking at it in the in-between routine that is just saving me from having to make that trip to the optometrist. That's a more a defined um, case in terms of like looking at vision care specifically. Um, but I think that um, definitely requires like future work that we're interested in doing and looking at then how are people actually using it? Because in the hands of the users, that's where we're seeing some of this interpretive flexibility that I can use this as a way for maybe working around ways that I want to um, get prescription for something that I'm not necessarily going to get prescribed from um, my primary care physician that I'm seeing face to face, um, or that I'm looking at this to kind of help with the lag in between for when I feel a flu or strep throat going on. Um, so looking at ways also in how these workarounds, because um, I think looking at how people are using some of these apps for what they um, might not interpret as these workarounds, but might be workarounds like to the policy. So I definitely agree that um, with our next steps and actually looking at how users are, are, are actually using this to perform, um, and they're the ones that are not necessarily knowledgeable about policies um, per se, that this app is being offered, I can use it, and not knowing that, oh, the reason that the state of Michigan has this um, law that I can't do a vision app here, but if I go cross state lines somewhere else, that I can use it and not necessarily understanding that you're then not being compliant with the policy, um, but because that policy is embedded in the tool that you don't see the policy text in the same way. Um, so uh, the, uh, the current uh, insurance uh, market is based on procedure. Uh, there's some like push towards like outcome-based uh, payments. Do you think on that light, this the type of the, 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 the misalignments that you see in the terms of the use of the technology may play like a bigger role because now you have to guarantee that the patient actually gets better as opposed to just I saw you and I get paid. Yeah, I think that's a great example. So in the case of these apps, I would argue that they're not necessarily always aligned with that continuum of care. If someone's being recommended when they leave from surgery or um, seeing their doctor, um, the app that maybe their health system provides that I'm going to need you to check in or I'm going to try to see you in two weeks, but I'll have a video consult. Um, when it's connected to the continuum of care, that I would argue that it, could, it, that it is aligned with the changes in the model for going to more value-based rather than fee-based care. Um, but some of these apps where you can sign up, download it, use it, um, and your primary care physician may not even know that you're that you're using it. Still, kind of adds to this the discontinuities that can happen with being able to see a doctor that might not be integrated in your care team. So, I think in terms of how these apps are being collectively part of someone's um, care and monitoring process, that I think that it can. Um, support that um, endeavor for pushing for value-based care, um, but these one-off apps um, that someone can still use, I think, can either further um, hamper that in trying to have that um, continuum of care. Yeah. Who do you think should be the uh, facilitator between like this tension between clinicians and technologists? Um, and you had mentioned earlier that you know technologists might be getting the upper hand in terms of lobbying and things. Um, but should there be a third party or should it be one of the two? Or like, how do you see that moving forward? Yeah, that's an, I remember from our conversations earlier where um, that who gets a say in how, uh, what the policies are, like who has the, the lobbying power to say that we don't think these apps should be on the market um, can definitely differ. Um, but then who's also, um, being able to construct that design. I think that clinicians definitely should be part of that design um, process in creating the technologies because they're the ones that can can allude to that, well, if we're adding, um, I need to make sure that I'm not pinged um, you know, back to back within 20 minutes for a request um, because I'm the only physician on call for taking the request for the doctor on demand at night, um, that that's really kind of leading to um, my own burnout. Um, that they're able to uh, 
be able to give a context in terms of like how they experience the practice of care um, in ways that technologists that are developing these apps might miss. Um, that it's great to understand what uh, the healthcare consumers would want so that they know how to market to them. Um, but that's where we kind of see the biggest gap in that clinicians who are on the other side of having to make sure that these apps can stay in existence and function also have to be part in that um, conversation as well with creating the apps. I'm curious about this, you know, we talk about there's in-person, then there's complete sort of M-health, but there's also this interstitial space where, you, where your primary care physician will like be made accessible through an app themselves. So it's not some sort of go mm -hmm. route around the system, it's, you know, now you can message your primary care physician or maybe, you know, maybe even get a quick conversation with them or you can you know, do all sorts of things with them. I'm wondering where do those kinds of applications fit into the ecosystem? How do they adjust the sorts of theories you're building or not? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, I think to your earlier point and, and, and being able to interview users. So it'd be great to interview users who have used these telehealth apps that were being referred to a specific app um, by their physician or a nurse practitioner, because then they know to kind of search for that, here's the logo I'm looking for, I'm looking for my health system, they're given the exact link to, and, and, and I would also be curious to know and how that affects trust, um, that I'm not kind of just using an app just because the description looks convincing or because I just need something very quickly. Um, but it would be interesting also to see in terms of like health outcomes that when someone has someone that is the same provider um, that they're being able to connect to of someone that recommended them to use it, uh, that I would argue that is being more tightly aligned with the continuum of care. Um, but you would have to know how to search, knowing what you're going and searching for as opposed to getting one that's like listed at the top 10 um, or the reviews that are that are most convincing. But most um, people right now, what they would be going through and searching for unless they've been recommended to go to it are just kind of in the wild, wild west of looking for what app seems fit for that time. Yeah. Do you have any idea on the light of, like, for example, generic apps like WhatsApp, how many doctors interact through WhatsApp with their patients. I've been hearing, i heard, I talked to a couple of doctors say like this is growing very rapidly, right? And our patients just WhatsApp their doctors or like, text them or message them. So not even a specialized app, just traditional. Yeah, I wouldn't have the, um, the figures on that, but in terms of the telehealth policy restrictions, like most states would prohibit that, um, um, especially if it's not an app that can ensure privacy and that the information is uh, being protected. Um, so like the, the offhand messaging, even through like social media, um, that most states prohibit um, that type of interaction. So it would be interesting to see what the stats are and um, what physicians um, you know, are providing that type of um, additional communication. And for whom? Oh, yes. The most common case I've seen, at least among my cohort, is using a telehealth app to get a prescription for birth control. Um, and that's like a very specific app for a specific focus. So I was just wondering if you see apps like that as common, like a specific app for a specific focus. Another example I could think of is like getting a prescription for medical marijuana card before it was legalized? Yes, for both of the examples that you mentioned, um, the latter, I, I initially thought when I saw one of um, getting the prescription for uh, marijuana, I thought like, oh, is this a weird copycat app that we need to you know, delete from the data and realizing that it's like, oh, there actually are apps like that. And, and I have seen um, an uptick in some of these specialized apps, especially with women's care. Uh, I can't remember the, the name of, um, the exact app that I uh, was thinking about, but the, um, but I, th I think having something that is more specialized with especially sensitive um, it, topics and issues um, that people would ascribe more trust that, well, if I'm getting an, a telehealth app that's specific for women's health, then I, I know that it's going to be someone that has a deeper expertise 
in this. Uh, so similar to with some of the mental health apps that I know that it's going to be um, a therapist that is participating on this and has expertise in being able to communicate in this way. Um, so I think that we will see some more of these specialized apps as people are looking for specific instances and like what type of care that they want. Um, but um, to my earlier point, it's this question of how can we make sure that is still supporting like the continuum of care um, still remains to be seen too. All right, let's thank our speaker. Great, thank you everyone.